Welcome back. This is Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm your instructor, David Leitner, and today we are going to talk about Neanderthal adaptations. How did nature shape the Neanderthals into what they were? Um, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so first point, Neanderthals are not so different from you and me. Okay, um, developmentally, physically, yeah, we can identify a few specific differences, but from a sort of firsthand, sort of like if you encountered a Neanderthal on the street, if they were dressed and shaved and, you know, did, you know, uh, just walked along the street, you would have no idea they were a Neanderthal. Okay. First thing about Neanderthals is that they were built for the cold. They evolved in these environments living near um, continental-sized glaciers. Okay, so they are, they have what's, what are called hyperpolar bodies. That follows Bergman's and Allen's rules, so they're short and stocky, short limbs, small surface to volume area, er, ratio. Uh, the barrel-chested nature sort of adds to that sort of surface-to-volume ratio. Um, uh, their bones are robust, extremely robust. They could survive breaks that would leave you or I disabled for the rest of our lives. Um, and finally, they have these wide nasal passages as a way of warming the air before it gets to the core of their body. That helps preserve their core body temperature, even though at the expense of cooling off the surface temperature. Their developmental and life histories are very similar to modern humans. Uh, you know, they would have reached their adolescence at about the same time, the adulthood at about the same time, would have lived about the same length of time. Uh, early childhood is, seems to be a little different. They seem to have developed more rapidly very early on. But by the age of four or five, human children catch up. So it's, uh, it's not that different. By the way, I just have to say, the images I'm using here from Tom Bjorklund, this man is amazing. I just, I, these are some of my favorite reconstructions of uh, Neanderthals, because they don't rely on any of the stereotypes, and they lean heavily into the fact that Neanderthals are humans. Uh, and I think we can fairly call them humans. Health and disease. Uh, evidence of lots of traumatic injury in some individuals. Uh, we know they had hard lives. They're living, in many cases, in rocky or mountainous terrain. Uh, and along with that come, you know, we have evidence of of frequent falls, uh, but those falls don't seem to leave them unable to care for themselves or, or with the help of others, continue living. Um, possibly, too, some of those skeletal injuries are from hunting. One thing we know is they didn't have a lot of throwing spears, so they didn't um, use the light, long spears with atlatls that um, more archaic Homo sapiens seem to have, and modern Homo sapiens uh, did, in, uh, developed in Africa. That's kind of interesting. Um, they used more robust spears with larger spearheads that um, they would have to get in up close to the prey. So they would have to isolate an individual from the herd, preferably a smaller one or a sicker one, we think. I mean, some of this is guesswork, educated guesswork, but still guesswork. Um, and have to get in close to, uh, with a group of other Neanderthals uh, to actually take it down. So maybe that explains some of these injuries too, because that's a good way to get hurt. <laughs> so, uh, but probably also just the ruggedness of the terrain. Now, what did they do? Behavior is a big adaptation, okay? Behaviors both for modern humans and for human, the genus Homo all the way through, behavior has been a primary um, adaptation to environmental change. So how did they adapt? 
Well, we have lots of material culture. Uh, the first being, we think they use their teeth frequently as tools. There's lots of wear and tear, almost like using it on like a third hand. If you're tying something, if you're working a, a piece of hide, anything like that. Uh, they're associated with the Shadow Peronian tradition, which is an extension of these prepared core traditions. Uh, they may have had thick wooden spears, like I said. Um, their culture also allows... The, and, and by the way, I'm going to refer to it as culture because it very much is cultural. It seems to vary. Their, their behavioral adaptations seem to vary, and their material culture seems to vary from site to site a little bit. Um... For instance, we don't find these things all over Europe, but in the Ukraine, um, they built structures out of mammoth cusks, leg bones, uh, hides, uh, evidence of long-term habitation in these things. So th they're not cavemen. They're not living in the caves. They, are, they have structures that they're building, um, possibly carrying with them as well. These could be disassembled, carried and carried elsewhere, though it seems doubtful because that's a lot to carry. Um, definitely one of the ways they would have coped with cold is to migrate. As things get colder, you go further south or you go down the mountain. Um, those are two strategies that are used by lots of people today. Uh, fire. We know they had fire. We know they used fire on a regular basis for cooking uh, and for warmth. Uh, we know they had clothing. We have evidence of this. Um, and like I say, evidence of structures. Hunting and subsistence. <clears throat> Isotope analysis at some sites shows a heavy meat reliance. So very, very, very high animal protein content in their diet changes the isotopes um, that... that compose their skeletons. Uh, the plaque analysis, though, so in other words, going in and taking the plaque off of their teeth. Plaque doesn't just, it's, it's made by bacteria, it's a hard sort of film, but it also traps bits of food in it as well, and there are some locations where the plaque analysis shows no meat whatsoever, all vegetable matter. So again, Saying there was one Neanderthal diet would be highly ridiculous. But you know what? Look at modern humans all over the globe. Our diets are different from place to place to place, depending on the resources we have, uh, but not entirely, also on traditions. So it shouldn't surprise us that Neanderthals may have had cultural differences in their diet. Um, cannibalism. We do have some places, like Goye Cave in Belgium, uh, where this, these are some of the remains from Goye Cave. And these bones, particularly these long bones here, show evidence of not just having broken, but being broken open by stone tools. Okay? They have sp uh, characteristic percussion marks on them that may indicate somebody broke it open in order to get at the marrow inside. This is one of those cases where I think we might be justified in talking about cannibalism, but again, what kind of cannibalism? What is the context for the cannibalism? It seems highly unlikely that they were hunting down their neighbors on a regular basis. Uh, probably more likely it is, uh, it has some sort of cultural significance uh, or spiritual significance to it, maybe even, though you don't want to jump to conclusions. But again, a varied diet across the landscape. We can't stereotype them into one thing, and that should excite us, because that, of course, makes sense if you look at modern humans today. Burials. There are some burials. We don't see a ton of evidence for grave goods. That is, they weren't necessarily leaving things in the grave with the body, potentially to, to take with them to the beyond. Uh, but uh, we do have burials at Spie Cave, La Ferrassie, La Chapelle au Saint, um, 
all of these are evidence of not just burials, but prepared burials. This body in front of you, and this is quite frequent too with Neanderthals, and also in many, many modern human societies, uh, burials were done in a fetal position. Um, uh, oftentimes in these burials, there's a particular orientation towards uh, either the sun or to the, the cardinal directions, like north, south, east, west, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, they, there, there's more to it than just digging a hole and dumping a body in the ground going on here. Uh, why does that matter? Why do you bury people unless your culture tells you that there's something persistent about the life of an individual after death? Um, I might be out on a limb here. I don't think it's unreasonable, though, to draw a conclusion from this that perhaps they thought there was a reason to bury them. Uh, at the very least, they didn't like the idea of scavengers taking them. So, ritual and symbolic behavior. Very little... I gotta, I gotta put a big asterisk here. Research over the past couple of years is really starting to challenge some of the, these conclusions here. But in terms of your book, <laughs> this is what it says. Very little in the Neanderthal archaeological record indicates lots of symbolic behavior. We don't have a ton of statues. We don't have uh, figurines. We don't have... Um, we may have some evidence for body decoration or not. May have evidence for um, buttons uh, from clothing, though potentially even that is highly debated. Um, you know, some people say, well, no, these things were just traded with modern humans. So uh, that said, pierced animal teeth used as necklaces, as adornment, amulets, that sort of thing. Um, we have an incised plate of a mammoth tooth from, from uh, Tata. Incised, meaning they basically were drawing on it. They were carving designs into it. Some potential uh, deposits of pigment, like ochre, like um, different colored clays, that sort of thing. Um, but again, like I say, newer research is coming in and maybe changing the shape of this. Keep an eye on this for the next 10 years or so, because we may have a completely different position on this 10 years from now. Just a reminder, anthropology is a living science. We are constantly gaining new information about the past that changes the assumptions we had before. Uh, and that's good. That's how science is supposed to work. Now, one of the most controversial, and this will be the last thing, one of the most controversial things is whether or not Neanderthals had languages. Okay. Um, there is, there are a couple of pieces of evidence that suggest, uh, of direct evidence that suggests they might have, and also some indirect evidence. I'll do the indirect first. The indirect is that there's clearly at least some symbolic thought going on. It may not be as prevalent as in anatomically modern humans or not, but there's something going on there. Um, and they're also passing on um, tool traditions, tool-making traditions that are very complex it's hard to think that, that that would be done without some form of language, linguistic communication. Not just sort of grunts and pointing, but like actual sort of um, having sounds or signs that stand in for meaning. Um, that's, that, that's indirect evidence. Direct evidence is that they have a floating hyoid bone like ours. You need that hyoid bone there for muscle attachments that control the larynx, okay, and allow you to make the range of sounds that you do. The other key piece of evidence is they have a version of a gene called FOXP2. FOXP2 um, 
regulates the development of the anatomical and the neurological development of speech. Uh, that is important. They have the same version modern Homo sapiens have. No other mammal has this, as far as we know. We are the only two, and that's very important because, as we'll find out in a future video, language requires a whole bunch of changes to the anatomy of the of the both the the cranium and the and the um, the chest and the throat. Um, without these changes, communicating through language is impossible. This is why, for instance, babies, human babies, are uh, able to understand speech much sooner than they can can actually produce it because some of the key anatomical features that allow you to produce speech are not in place yet. They haven't they haven't developed yet uh, in babies. Um, that same architecture, that same anatomy of the larynx and the pharynx is, appears to be present in Neanderthals. I think that is possibly the most profound discovery of the past sort of 15, 20 years. The idea that not only did our ancestors intermingle with these groups, but that they would, might have seen them as peers, that they might have seen them as human, as human as you or I, is profound. Think about that. Think about a world where more than one human exists, but you don't think of them as not human. The only reason we think of them as not human today is because we were the only ones around when we started studying them. I think that is profound. I think it also, uh, the idea that there is Neanderthal language may also entail the, the fact that there may have been Neanderthal stories. There may have been Neanderthal, um, we know there was music. There may have been songs, because we do find some musical instruments. How fascinating is that? Because Neanderthals are older than our own species. Think of it. it also pushes the origin of language back much further, because if we have the FOXP2 gene, they have the FOXP2 gene, we have the hyoid bone, they have the hyoid bone, then we have to share a common ancestor that had both of those things already which might imply that speech goes back into Homo erectus past, maybe further. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean there was language. It could just be a capability that later got adapted for language, but at least the pieces were there. I don't know. I Maybe you don't find it as profound as I do, but I think it's, it's quite humbling in terms of understanding our place in the universe. Uh, and were it not for some flukes of the environment, uh, we may not be alone today on this planet. Think about that. Anyways, thank you very much. Uh, this concludes uh, my not TED Talk and uh, concludes Chapter 12. Take care of yourself. Have a great week. And um, I'll see you soon.